Please welcome KeyBank Director of Continuous Delivery and Feedback, John Rezatarski. Hey, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, I'm good. I made sure I, you know, the, if the handshake was going to go low, I was going to be there for it because if dropped down, not so funny. Uh, no, we're excited to be here to tell you our journey. A little bit about KeyBank. We are one of the top 15 largest banks in the United States that you've probably never heard of. Uh, but we're headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio. So go Cavs. Yes. Thank you. I was waiting for somebody to clap. Please. Um, so no, we're, we're real excited. Uh, we grew up through acquisition. We're about 190 years old. So if you think about how many banks we've acquired in the time of 190 years to become one of the top 15 largest banks, that's a lot of servers and machines and applications all coming together. And that's going to be a big part of the, the story I'm about to tell. And every good story starts with admitting that you have a problem. Um, one of our first issues that we, we had a couple years ago, and it was a very significant issue, um, it took us down pretty much the entire day. And when we tried to fix it, we actually made it worse. I don't know if anybody's actually gone through something similar, but it was really because we didn't understand our complexity. I had mentioned that we acquired a lot of banks. Most recently, we acquired First Niagara out of Buffalo, and we executed that, that acquisition last year. As part of that, we got a new Unisys mainframe. I'm pretty sure saying new Unisys mainframe is an oxymoron. I don't think that makes much sense. Um, so as, so uh, we, put the, we, we, we looked at exactly what our online banking flow actually was. And, and we, we routed out every individual step. And when we did that, we identified so many different issues. We identified the fact that when one user logged in, we actually had over 200 network hops. We were bouncing back and forth between our two different data centers anywhere from 10 to 30 times. And it was just, it was just so much so complex that we were like, anytime we tried to fail something over, it just wasn't working. So we really had to take a step back and say, all right, let's go through, let's do an assessment, let's realize where our issues are, and let's try to correct those. Now, how we got there was was because of this acquisition, because of these problems. And you know what? I'm sorry. Can you go back one slide? I messed up. I hit it too fast. We became a, go back one. There we go. So we, we became a very siloed IT organization because we had so many different systems to support. And I love this picture because this really actually shows uh, the finger pointing that happens in organizations our size. So we, we had to fix all the network issues. We had to fix all of the system issues and where we were running systems of record between two different data centers. That was the easy stuff. The hard stuff was saying, how do we prevent this from happening again? I mentioned the, the metrics as well. A big answer for that was DevOps. How can we change our culture to have more of a culture of engineering? Now, anybody starting a DevOps journey, don't rework the wheel. There is a ton of material out there for you. Gene Kim, Jez Humble, John Willis, they all give you the answers that, that, you, that you need. And the way I like to explain DevOps is actually talking through Farley's laws. So law number one, people believe before they doubt. To err is to human. We all make mistakes. And we're going to continue to make those mistakes. Law number two, things are more complicated than you think. We don't understand the complexity. We actually hit that when we hit our big issue. He has a third law as well, and it's... Uh, uh, every, all stuff is interesting, and I think it's basically these first two laws are so depressing that he needs a third law there to make himself, everybody feel better. Uh, but what is he, he tells us though that to combat this, you have to combat these two laws with experimentation. It's all about, we know we're going to make mistakes, and we know that we don't understand the complexity, so you know we're going to fail. So we have to fail fast, and that's exactly what we wanted to do. And this directly correlates to our methodology. We were a typical waterfall organization like so many other large enterprises. We assess an opportunity, we plan for it, we develop it, we made sure we had all the requirements, then we test it and we deploy it. And it went so perfectly and we were on time and on budget, and none of that is true. Right? So if we look at Farley's laws and we apply that, yes, we still have to assess, we still have to develop, but let's automate everything we can in between. Automate infrastructure components, automate testing, automate release, automate validation. And that's, that's, that's where you get these fast cycles. And then you accept or reject that change. Because of Farley's laws, we know that we're going to fail because we're human and we don't understand the complexity. 
one of our tech leads actually drew this on the whiteboard while we were going through one of our implementations. And it makes so much sense, because if you're a big snake taking two big bites, it's kind of hard to digest all that. But if you take little bites, it's much easier. So we went out, and a team of, uh, of folks and me, we, we built a pitch for our CIO. And once again, following the Godfathers, the Gene Willis, or the, the Gene Kim, the John Willis, they'll tell you right away, metrics-driven approach. Go tell your CIO what metrics you're going to affect. For us, it was mean time to resolution and release frequency. Those were both going to be two big items we were going to hit. And, she, and, we, and we sold her on it. We had to narrow down scope. So here's the thing. It, like People that want to say, hey, we're going to build a DevOps practice, or we're going to do this, we're going to do that. You know, you're not going to change the world overnight. You got to pick your, you got to pick your battles. For us, it was three main areas. It was containers, it was automated testing, and by the way, if anybody tells you a DevOps story and it doesn't include automated testing, they're not telling you a DevOps story. And the last piece is continuous delivery. So you need that to kind of bring all the glue together. So we, now that we had our scope, we had our team, we, uh, we needed to put together the team, which was really, you know, Docker's four years old. So this stuff's young. You need some solid people here. So you need to go find those change agents that can actually help you change the world. Um, we were angel funded. So our CTO and our chief architect kind of opened up their wallets and said, we're going to build a little mini startup inside our bank. And then the project selection, don't go after the easy falling off the tree. Go after something that's going to be impactful. At our time, we were actually re redesigning our online banking platform. We were really excited about it. So the way that we put the team together and actually, I'm referencing here uh, uh, something that Matthew Skelton wrote a blog about, different ways to introduce DevOps into an organization. And this concept is called DevOps as a service. So we basically were a small team. We sat between development and operations and really helped to manage the release of the online banking application as it was being built. Now, I'll tell you, you don't want to be a new silo. You don't want to be a new distributed. So we need to smoothly collaborate. We should be putting ourselves out of a job if we're doing our job right. So our first scope item was containers. And everybody makes up words at these conferences and stuff, so mine's container Geddon. Uh, because I think it's coming, and it's going to destroy everyone, uh, and it's fantastic. So uh, when we're building an application, we start with a product. We require infrastructure. Oh. And as part of that first piece of infrastructure, I'm sorry. There we go. OK, so as part of that, we take that infrastructure, we virtually slice it in half, and we, have, uh, uh, we virtualize it so that we can get more bang for our buck. Then we install operating system components on it. Then we install frameworks. Then we install more frameworks. Then we install applications. <laughs> All right, there we go. So uh, then we install the platform itself, and then we finally install the applications that are up on top of it, right? Now we're done. No. Now we have to go through and we have to test and validate, uh, or, or we have to make sure we have the right security model and the right operational configuration so that we have all the right logging in place um, and we have all the right alerting in place. Now we're done, right. No, now we have to test and we have to validate each individual component from a dependency perspective. Now we're done. No, we got to start all over again when we patch, upgrade, and hotfix all of the different environments. Now, each of these boxes is typically at a, bit, a different team. So imagine being the project manager trying to cross-communicate across all of these different boxes and lines. That's why it took us two months to get servers out the door, right, and get an application actually installed. And by the way, I had to do that four times because I have a dev environment and an IT environment and so on and so on. Containers. Build once, build it in code, move it around on immutable infrastructure removes responsibility from our legacy infrastructure teams. I like to say we cheated, basically, at, at our kicking off DevOps. This is shifting left and being able to produce fast infrastructure that's more consistent and less error prone because there's no human involvement. Fantastic piece of technology. So containers are great by themselves, but they don't give me high availability. They, do, they don't give me uh, zero down deployments. They don't give me readiness checks, and all the goodness that I need because I have to keep my application available as, at the highest service levels. So that's where Kubernetes comes in. 
And, and we evaluated several of the different uh, uh, platforms that were out there. Kubernetes was the winner you know, by far. And I'm looking at Raffaele Spazzoli. He helped us make the decision. All right, Raf. Um, so yeah, so we, now we had Kubernetes. We had Docker. Now the, the, the rest of it was really starting to fall in line. Uh, we focused very heavily on, on test automation, moving over to Cucumber. And our business analysts started writing Gherkin. I mean, it was just it was insane. And I think the, the really important thing to look at here was all of our project teams are now actually producing something that's going into our automation pipeline. If it's Gherkin, it's business. You know, they're writing, they're writing test scripts in Gherkin. Your infrastructure is writing code that goes into Chef that builds our images. Our application developers and our test developers are, are writing test code. And, and now we have this ability to pr produce these amazing dashboards to go directly back to our development and project, our project management teams to actually tell them the health versus somebody managing it in a spreadsheet in a PowerPoint deck that, that says, we're yellow. I don't know why we're yellow, but we're yellow. So our test automation changes were extremely successful. So what we called our test automation before would take 1,200 minutes to run, and it typically found zero defects. When we were, when we were in the middle of doing the majority of the development, our, we actually were using Selenium Grid, and we were running it out on, on OpenShift um, and distributing that load. And it was running you know, over 1,200 different tests in 12 minutes. And we were identifying defects 10 times a day on a daily basis. So from a test automation perspective, it was a huge success. And this is the part where I like to beat my chest a little bit. So I mentioned that we acquired First Niagara last year. So during the busiest time of the day and the most logins per second, during this acquisition, we had to make changes. Because guess what? We had some user experience issues. For the first Niagara customers that needed to enroll, it was a little complicated for them, and we needed to be able to react fast. We were able to put 10 production releases into production, 10 changes of, into, into production with zero defects during the highest amount of volume that we've ever served, and it affected no one. And that was the power of OpenShift. Thank you. So great success story for us. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that we embrace open source. We love to contribute back to, the op to open source projects. Um, and uh, this, has been a, this has been a great conference. Thank you, guys.